um, in the 19th century. Back then, these typologies were focused on the differentiation between earthen mounds and burrows that contain megalithic structures. As the discipline of archaeology developed, so did classifications and typologies. More detailed information about sites, features and objects enticed the creation of seemingly distinctive types. So while most of the early um, typologies, uh, typologies of Neolithic burial structures featured uh, on the actual appearance of the burrows, Ian Kinnis focused on mortuary and related features found underneath these burrows in the 1970s to 1990s. By doing so, he identified six major categories of mortuary structures. These categories can also be combined. For example, a linear zone can have a stone pavement, as seen here for the uh, example for Giants Hill 2, which is defined by a linear zone marked by the two post holes at either side of the, uh, either end of the zone and a pavement of stone. <coughs> Similar approaches have been taken for the TRB sites. Again, the earliest typologies were concerned with the burrows themselves. But more recent research undertaken by Bärbel Woll and Rainer Kossian in the 1990s and early 2000s have developed very detailed typologies of the actual mortuary features. However, slightly contrasting to Kinner's typology, Woll and Kossian both created subtypes for each possible addition or combination of general types. While Woll um, has created a letter number based system, Kossian sticks with the word based terminology, adding its extra elements as their actual term. They try to make accounts for any possibility um, that could, even those who don't even exist yet, but could potentially exist in the future, by giving specific characteristics a name or a number respectively. They can endlessly combine these numbers and letters. And again, they can potentially create new types in the future. While Kinnan's limited amount of defined types look stagnant and <coughs> maybe non-changeable, these systems introduced by Woll and Kossian seem quite time-enduring and adaptable to change. And this also reflects forms of relations as subtypes can be connected with or related to each other. However, what is still missing from these typologies are the intangible relations with, for example, landscapes or events and different types of usage in different contexts. My research focuses on identifying social relations of early Neolithic communities by interpreting the remains of specific ritual events and treatment of the dead at mortuary structures and earthen long burrows. As, as some features can be found in the British Isles apparently show close similarities to features found in Denmark and northern Germany, as has been recognized from the 1950s onwards, it has been argued that a more or less profound connection between the two geographical areas must have existed during the earlier Neolithic. I created my own typology to help me with the process of my data collection. The main reason behind this approach was to help to truly identify the supposedly similarities and differences of not only sites within one specific area, but between all of the geographical research areas. Hence, as the existing typologies are somewhat different from each other, I had to create my own typology to have a, st a starting common ground. This typology had to be detailed as well as flexible. I tried to combine the two approaches uh, of Kissian, uh, uh, Kossian and Kinnis and have differentiated four major categories. The first three include features according to their building material, earth, wood and stone. The fourth, uh, fourth category, fire, relates to activities or events at these features that are so prominent in the use and development of these sites that it's worth including these as a, as a significant type of its own. Just as with Kinnis and Kossian's typologies, elements um, within the major categories can be combined and therefore overlap. For example, a, lin a, 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 again, for example, a linear post arrangement can have a stone pavement and been burned down. For each subtype, I have created an ideal, idealized prototype. Let's have a look, a uh, closer look at the type that I have called linear post arrangement. This type includes um, li Kinnis linear zone 
as well as Kossian's grave with complex wooden structures. In its simplest form, it is constructed by two posts, either split, as illustrated in the schematic plan here, or as whole posts, which mark the outer limits of a linear area which can either have been constructed prior to the actual burial feature or is used as the place for mortuary deposition. These two posts can have additions like a stone row um, along the sides or pavements or other things. Another form of the linear post arrangement shows more than two posts, whereas the additional post or posts are found in the medi medial part of the linear zone. And again, these structures can have additional features. So far, I have shown you a classical typology of early Neolithic mortuary features that can be applied to sites in the British Isles, as well as Denmark and Northern Germany, and potentially other areas as well. As I criticized in the introduction of my paper, my types are just as detached from less tangible elements, such as landscapes, events, etc. But it helps to directly compare site types of the research areas. Some of the sites indeed seem very similar, with two posts at either end of the structure and a stone frame enclosing the linear area or a stone pavement. It also allowed me to see major differences. For example, all such sites of the TRB group are only defined by two posts and never show internal posts, even if the rest of the feature looks the same as for the British Isles. Furthermore, the, uh, for the TRB, oval or pear-shaped so-called Trollstrup type stone frame features are known with stone plates as, at their entrances, which have not been found in the British Isles. Also, the amount of force structures, such as facades and avenues or forecourts, are much more varied in the British Isles and seem to be more restricted for the TRB group. So far, the TRB reflects a much more unified burial custom, whereas the sites in the British Isles show much more regional variation. So to figure that out, a classical typology surely was quite helpful. But now the features need to be seen in their social context, and that is quite difficult to do. In the case of these sites here, those mortuary features in the British Isles and Denmark look the same on the excavation plan, but the two different users had different traditions of using it. For the observer, meaning the archaeologist today, it would not be possible to draw that conclusion just by looking at the type of feature alone. Other aspects need to be considered for the interpretation. Minimum number of individuals, treatment of the dead, articulated, disarticulated, site development, force, uh, force structures, etc. etc. <coughs> so let's have a quick look um, at the actual differences when it comes to the burial customs. The British sites have been used as communal burial places, mainly over a longer time span. They have continuously been revisited, human bones have been moved within the features, new bodies been added. The mortuary structure itself has been redeveloped and rebuilt. Other structures, such as facades, have been added before the final destruction of the features by fire and building of the long burrow. The Danish sites, on the other hand, mainly show single burials of one articulated individual. The features itself had not been developed or rebuilt. In fact, new features of the same or different type had been built a few meters further away, but which had later been covered by the same lumber, as you can see in some <coughs> of these photos here. <coughs> these structures probably had not been re uh, reused over a longer time span. They don't show developments and seem to have been constructed constructed as a ready-to-go structure to host only one, uh, one individual. And again, I would like to re remind everyone that the site plans of these different areas do look fairly similar, and according to my typology, they represent the same type. But they have been used quite differently in the end. So can we still say there is the same type in this case? A classical typology would say yes, the, fe the features are defined by these specific parameters, for example, two post-defined uh, for example, two post-defined linear zone with a stone pavement. But a relational inference typology would say no. For example, yes, we have these um, two subtypes, the post structure and the stone pavement uh, are the same, but the minimum number of individuals, the treatment of the dead, the reuse of the feature, the destruction of the feature, etc., etc., are different. 
So they are not entirely the same type and do not have entirely the same meaning for the user of these structures and are related to different kinds of events. So while the classical typology might be misleading when it comes to interpretation for the modern observer, a relational approach which considers additional factors such as the actual use, events, um, etc., allows to see differences of an otherwise communally appearing tradition. So to add a bit of a third dimension to my typology, I constructed the major category fire. This in general contains all subgroups that theoretically can be found in the categories of earth, wood and stone. However, most of them relate to wooden elements of the sites. As said earlier, this category relates, um, relates more to the factor of a happening or an event, the burning down of a structure, for example, a facade or the mortuary area itself. As well, as well as burned objects, for example, burned flints or burned bones. This category therefore relates uh, to the actual use or more the destruction process of features. I would like to argue that this category therefore adds another layer to the otherwise conventional typology I've outlined above. As these kind of events are easily traceable through the remains that we can see archaeologically. A theoretical interpretation, interpretation about their meaning is a quite different manner, uh, matter, however. Um, yeah. <coughs> the typology cannot give an answer to this question of interpretation. Although the relationally orientated typology might assist in doing so more than the conventional typology. To reconstruct and help understand the actual happenings or events at sites, all possible factors need to be considered. It could be argued that most, if not all of these further aspects could be added to a typology and then used to combine a relational um, the relational types with each other. However, would that be feasible or would that just be an endless table of numerous possibilities and combinations of type that in the end will tell us nothing more that we just couldn't write down in simple words and sentences? For the last few minutes of my paper, I want to draw a connection between the theme of the TAR conference this year, which is visualization, and our session. And this also relates to the difficulty that I just mentioned. The more layers we add to a typology, the more complex it gets. While a classical typology shows nice, standardized, typical forms and figures as we know them from lengthy, fine catalogues, by simplifying and bringing order into a jungle of numbers, of different features and things and their variations. A relation typology adds another level, level to the task of visualization. Less tangible elements like events, landscapes, customs and context, etc., complicate the principle of a demonstration that is easy to understand for a non-expert. A relational typology could be so exclusive that you would need to study months to understand um, all of the connections that are enticed by the original author. At an earlier stage of my PhD research, I experimented with the types that I constructed for my conventional typology to illustrate how these types are interconnected with each other. This might look a bit familiar, it's the same concept that Neil introduced earlier. So this illustration shows, uh, shows a circle in which types are connected according to the frequency in which each type occurs, occurs with another type or feature. In my opinion, this looks a little bit chaotic, even though specific trends can be made out. For example, for example there is a high relation between mortuary areas and stone cover. I then picked out specific types, such as the mortuary structures themselves and other pre features, like force structures, to illustrate the significance of their relations. <laughs> Because there are less types to consider, the illustration looks somewhat more visually appearing and easier to understand. I have done this with other combinations of features, for example, the fire category 2. So my conclusion from this experiment was that it can help to understand the significance of relations between types, but only if the number of times, uh, types is limited to a feasible number. However, that does mean that, again, that it again excludes other types. <clears throat> and sometimes it is also important to know what kind of types don't go together. So that aspect completely falls off the rack if excluding type from this kind of um, this, this sort of visualization. This graph is based on an Excel spreadsheet as seen here. As seen here. <laughs> 
it would be quite easily possible to just add another column and another column and another column and tick the boxes where appropriate. Well, this is, this is just a screenshot of parts of that table. It is already very, very long and the longer it gets, the more unmanageable and inconvenient the table gets. Sometimes we just want it easy and want to see how everything pulls together at one glance. That is strictly impossible with a table like this, where you have to scroll in all directions to see everything and you never see everything in the same picture. And as I said earlier, what I showed here with my types, they only include the relation with other defined types and I haven't included any other elements yet. To add other, 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 to add other elements of any kind, however, you just we would need to give them a name or a term and just with a conventional typology, give a description to the name and, to, um, and a definition what they mean in the context and voila, you could have another term and another type mm -hmm. and another kind of illustration. But is this a good way of doing it? If we define type after type after, after type, would this not mean that we are restricting ourselves again by recreating an intangible thing or aspect into a defined inflexible type? So I'm wondering, is a relational typology limited by its own limitlessness? Thank you.